As she said, I'm John Rula. I'm a PhD student at Northwestern. And so today I'm presenting work called When IPs Fly, uh, a case for redefining aircraft communication. This is work done with my advisor, Fabian Bustamante, as well as Dave Chaffness, who's here uh, from Northeastern University. Uh, so I'm sure we're all familiar with the airline industry. Uh, I'd be surprised if anyone didn't fly here today and then drive a significant amount. Um, but it's, it's well known for its many problems and poor performance, which include excessive delays and flight cancellations. And a lot of this is due to its impressive growth. So if we look at the, air, the global airline industry, in 2014 alone, it carried 3.3 million passengers, over 33 million flights. Uh, and it's also growing pretty consistently. Over the last 10 years, it's averaged 5.6% uh, year over year. Um, this is bad because this growth is expected to continue at that same rate over the next 20 years. Uh, and so in this case, uh, in 2035, it's expected to see 9.5 billion passengers. Um, and this is a problem, because even now we're seeing signs of its scalability limits, of congestion within the system itself. In the US, already 20% of flights are delayed uh, or canceled. Um, and when you look at why, uh, it's not what you would expect. Um, weather and external factors only account for around 3.3% of all flight delays. Most of these are systemic issues internal to the system. So things like late arriving aircraft from excessive holding patterns or air carrier delay. Um, there's even a category called national aviation system delay. It was unclear what that was, but it seems like it's a systemic issue. Um, the issue is this is, you know, this is now and this is not accounting for what's soon to be 3x growth over the next 20 years. Um, so when we talk about the system, what are we actually talking about? So this is the Global Air Traffic Management System. So this is managed by several organizations, one of which is the ICAO, as well as the FAA. And what this does is plans, tracks, schedules, and manages all of global air traffic. So it contains functions like communicating between uh, air traffic controllers and pilots, um, tracking planes through airspace, uh, making sure they're on path, as well as scheduling those paths from source to destinations. Uh, and lastly, it's traffic management. It's scheduling takeoffs and landings um, at airports. So just when we look at these interactions, it might be easier for us as a community to think about this as a mobile distributed system, where uh, your aircraft are your mobile nodes, uh, your air traffic control towers are your fixed sinks, and your surveillance stations that are scattered throughout the world are kind of part of a large sensor network. Um, just keep that in mind. But so if we look at how the system actually works, let's look at the individual components. So there's, I mean, it's an extremely complicated system, but here are some of the main highlights of it. So the primary way that aircraft are actually tracked are through radar surveillance. And so there's two types of this. Uh, one is primary radar, the other is secondary radar. Primary is contained at major aircraft hubs, uh, or major airports, um, and actually have a five second delay between location updates. Secondary surveillance stations are uh, smaller, uh, lower power radar stations that are kind of distributed all throughout the world. These are what track your flight as you're moving from, you know, between Miami and Chicago. And the problem with these is that because they're smaller, they actually have a 12 second delay uh, between location updates. So the whole system is built on this fact that at any given point in time, you know, there's possibly tens of seconds where you're not sure where aircraft are. Um, so the next are these things, these plane transponders. So these are things that are, that are fitted on every single aircraft. Uh, and what they do is when pinged by a radar station, what they do is they respond with uh, an aircraft identification code and depending on the version, um, uh, something like an altitude or other piece of information. Uh, and these are meant to supplement these kind of secondary stations that don't have enough power to actually determine altitude from a radar. Uh, lastly are aircraft communications. So when air traffic controllers communicate with aircraft, a lot of times they, you do it over VHF radio and it's all voice based. Uh, Okay, so more recently you've also seen a new class of aircraft communication that's arisen, uh, and this is internet connectivity in the form of in-flight uh, Wi-Fi services. And so these basically come in two main varieties. You have direct air-to-ground, which is uh, GoGo Internet's main one, and so this uses cellular technology to talk to uh, basically cell stations on the ground. The other is mobile satellite service, which bounces, this, um, which bounces communications off of satellites. And so they each have their own benefits and drawbacks. If you're directed to ground, you have to build these ground stations and you have to uh, maintain them. If you're satellite, you have basically an 88,000 mile uh, round trip distance to do, which is almost 500 milliseconds of speed of light delay in and of itself. Um, but you also have better spatial coverage and you don't have to build ground towers and things like that. So 
if we actually look at the system and we look at how information is disseminated throughout the system in terms of location updates, aircraft communication, uh, things that you want is a, you're basically trying to become to a shared uh, consistent state uh, with aircraft and air traffic controllers, we see that you know, this lack of information communication, these latencies uh, are basically a key bottleneck that are holding back this global air traffic management system. So, oops. so how bad are it? Are they? So uh, each of these are independent technologies, but if we actually look at them in terms of the amount of bits that they can transmit over time, we come up with two metrics that we call effective latency and effective throughput. So on the graph right now are four main aircraft technologies. Uh, most, um, the, those in blue are plane transponders which communicate location information. Um, but what we see is because they respond with uh, mode S and mode AC basically have 60 bits that are transmitted potentially between 5 and 12 seconds. So you have what amounts to you know, single bits of per second to tens bits per second of effective, latency, of effective throughput with 10 seconds of effective uh, latency. And these are terrible. And if you contrast these especially with uh, these more modern communications that exist, we see that there's in some cases 10 orders of magnitude higher throughput from mobile satellite service, several orders of magnitude lower latency, um, and it's, uh, it's just very apparent that the current system is being held back by these antiquated uh, communication technologies. So, you know, as I said, like, we think that these latencies are a key problem. How does this actually manifest itself in the system? So the system is designed around these, um, you know, these high latencies. And so if we look at the spatial efficiency of all flights in the United States. So um, if you're flying in a plane through secondary surveillance, which is most of the time, you actually, each plane has to contain, uh, maintain 3.3 nautical miles of spacing between every other aircraft, which is a fairly inefficient use of airspace. And the reason is because you have this 12 second of latency for a successful update, uh, if you're a plane that's traveling 500 miles an hour, um, that's potentially a 1.6 mile radius that you have uh, no idea about. So these things are built for safety, but they're also, also held back by these high latencies. Um, so another example is on uh, landings. So I don't know if you knew this, but uh, planes don't actually do a, a smooth glide down to land. What they do is they actually step through these kind of plane, these fixed altitude planes. So if you've ever been landing and you're in your descent and you're wondering why your plane's accelerating, it's because it's having to step through these, um, these kind of fixed altitude planes that they use to account for this lack of location information. Uh, and each time you level, it uses additional fuel and uh, costs more money. And so they've run tests recently with performance navigation and have, sa have shown savings of around uh, 40 to 70 gallons of fuel each landing and increased runway capacity by 15%, you know, just by getting rid of these kind of uh, artificial planes. So now that we kind of have an understanding of you know, what's holding back this global air traffic management system, what can we do about it? Um, so our proposal is that the industry actually shift from these collection of uh, proprietary single-use hardware, each with their own communication channel, uh, and shift over to a, a common high-performance data channel. Um, and if you have this, a lot of things get really easy and you can do a lot more uh, interesting things with it. So first and foremost, you can enable system innovation. Uh, if you have a common channel, you know, it's possible that you can do things in software. You don't actually have to update, retrofit every single aircraft in the global uh, air travel system. Um, you, know, you can improve efficiency because you have increased updates. And you can enable some kind of interesting novel applications. Uh, so things like airborne distributed systems, real-time uh, aircraft analytics, um, and provide increased awareness from uh, from other aircraft around it just by broadcasting over the same channel. So let's take a look at a couple of these. Uh, enabling system innovation. So as you said, uh, one of the key problems now is that it's extremely hard to upgrade global air traffic systems. So since 1950, there's only been three major overhauls to the entire system. One was mode C for transponders in the 1960s, mode S in 1988, uh, and the new one is ADS-B, which is um, currently deployed but is expecting full deployment by 2018. Uh, and the problem, as we said before, is you have to retrofit not only all of the ground stations, but you have to uh, place new hardware on every single aircraft that's flying. And it's really expensive, and the carriers push back, and it's, it's not a good thing. Um, also, we saw, this, we saw a lot of parallels with this to kind of the state of networking uh, 40, 50 years ago, where some of, the, some of the things that have really enabled innovation on the internet have been the end-to-end -end principle, where you, complain, you contain the complexity at the edge um, so that you can innovate much faster. And so we think a similar thing could happen in the air traffic management system uh, just by switching over to a common communication channel. Also, if you have this communication channel, 
Um, you can do interesting things, like I mentioned before, like airborne distributed systems, where they can be used as basically a fault tolerant backup of air traffic control, where they can share information between each other um, if, for say, air traffic control goes down, which occasionally it's been known to do. Um, also, interestingly enough, uh, one, of, one of my co-authors said that on his flight down here, uh, you know, the pilot said that a pilot in front of him had alerted him that there was some turbulence uh, ahead and that they should prepare for that, and they told everyone to put their seatbelts on. But, you know, if, as we've seen with cars, you throw an accelerometer on the dashboard and you communicate this to all the planes around you, you have real-time turbulence tracking. So it just enables a new class of kind of uh, application that currently doesn't exist in, these, in air travel. So we wanted to kind of test this. You know, we wanted to see what kind of performance or what kind of characteristics we can get from uh, planes in flight. And, um, you know, because planes are flying over large geographic distances, they're 30,000 feet in the air, they're traveling at 500 miles an hour, is this even possible to do this? Um, and also it's difficult to uh, test this on a live system for many, many reasons. Um, but there are these kind of modern channels that already exist on aircraft today, and these are these in-flight Wi-Fi services. So what we did was, uh, over the past year on uh, several flights across the country, we uh, purchased these in-flight services and we conducted kind of an extensive series of network diagnostic tests uh, in order to kind of uh, determine channel capacity, kind of what kind of perf what performance uh, issues could arise and, and how we could deal with that. Um, and so uh, let's take a look at some of those results. So latency, as we said before, latency is one of the most important things for system efficiency. So what kind of latencies can we get from these aircraft? Uh, so, interestingly enough, directed to ground, we can get around 150 milliseconds of median RTT uh, you know, across the board. Satellite service, as I said before, has 88,000 miles to go, so they average around like 750 milliseconds uh, for pings. But regardless of that, these are still orders of magnitude lower latencies than exist in these, in these uh, you know, current aircraft systems. Um, the next most important thing is reliability. If you're going to use this for things that are hauling passengers around, you obviously want it to be an extremely reliable link. You don't want it to go down. It's going to cause huge problems. Uh, when we look at packet loss, you know, almost 70% uh, of all direct air to ground flights had 0% packet loss. Um, and even mobile satellite service had around 15% uh, at the 90th percentile. And just keep in mind, these are lower bounds on performance because this is a shared channel. Uh, you know, it's split between all the, all the consumers on the flight, and it's, for, it's, it's a luxury item. Uh, lastly, we want to see if how consistent are these communications. You're traveling large geographic distances. You know, is that going to pose a problem for these systems? Uh, and for the most part, this is for a DAT, uh, this is a direct air to ground flight. Uh, we see that for the most part, it's fairly consistent. Um, you know, you do see areas that kind of are spatially correlated, uh, which we kind of attribute to um, problems with the ground stations or uh, you know, signal contention or things like that. Things that if you're actually designing an air traffic control system where you'd have dedicated spectrum, uh, shouldn't actually be an issue. So. Uh, in conclusion, you know, this is a new research area for mobile network systems. We think there's a lot of really interesting uh, and very open problems here, uh, not the least of which is how to design an extremely reliable uh, guaranteed latency system for aircraft that are traveling 500 miles an hour or five miles up. Um, and so we think that in order to do this, that the aircraft industry has to shift away from its current model, it has to go to a common data channel. Um, and that there are already models that have been kind of well tested now that are, in many cases, deployed on a large fraction of global air fleets. Um, and lastly, shameless plug, we have a tool that if you guys want to measure your Wi-Fi your Wi on the way uh, back in the air, it's called Wi-Fly. Um, it's at wifly.aqualab.cs.northwestern.edu. Um, so please use it, because I would love some more data. And I would love to take questions. Thank you.